exciting week in South Bend. Yesterday, we finally got the chance to see the new leader of our men's basketball program. The athletics department invited the general public to Purcell Pavilion, where Shrewsbury, along with Jack Corbrick and Father John Jenkins, gave their visions to the program. Our Jake Einman has more. Notre Dame gathered inside Purcell Pavilion on Thursday morning with the entire athletic department, general public, and media all in attendance to welcome Micah Shrewsbury to the program. He got right to the point early as he took to the podium to answer some of the press questions, but started his opening statement saying he feels like he can win at Notre Dame and get the job done the right way. Uh, but the other thing is, and I truly believe this, you can win the national championship here. You can win the national championship here, and that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to fight for every single day. We're also going to do it the right way. We're going to find kids that fit Notre Dame. We're going to find kids that care about their academics. We're going to find kids that want to be great basketball players. Shrewsbury comes to Notre Dame from spending the past two seasons at Penn State. However, he is accustomed to South Bend after getting his head coaching career started at IU South Bend. For NDTV, I'm Jacob Irons. Now, let's send it back to the panel. JJ, let's start with you. You know, what defensive schemes do you see him going to? That was something that he talked about in the conference yesterday. Yeah, I think the bigger takeaway actually was less any one scheme or any one plan and more that he wants his team to be personnel dependent. He wants to build his offense and his defense based around the players he has, not any one ideology. He mentioned he's an old school kind of guy in terms of ideals, and I think that plays to, well, he's on defense. On, on defense, thematically, they're going to be hard-nosed. They're going to be a team that plays hard. They're going to play together. Togetherness was something he put against emphasis on. But I don't think they're going to do any one variation. They're not going to play a 2-3 zone. They're not going to go man-to-man. -man. He didn't commit to any one thing, which I think is notable because you saw Penn State. He was willing to adapt his offense based on what players he had running it. When he had Jalen Pickett, he ran more of a post-up and then shoot offense. You know, He's run different offenses at Purdue or helped engineer different offenses at Purdue, depending on personnel. I think the defense will be very similar to that. I don't think he has any one scheme, at least that he brought up in the press conference that he's particularly married to. I think he's willing to commit to whatever works best depending on who comes back from Notre Dame, who he adds in the transfer portal. I think his team will be very personnel dependent, and I think that's going to apply to defense as much as it does offense. All right, that's, that's very interesting, JJ. Another thing that, that uh, he kind of discussed and touched on a little bit in the press conference, Kelly, is that transfer portal. What can he do to get to his team to 500 next year, whether it's through the transfer portal or just through recruiting? I think, I mean, number one is he has to focus on recruiting. None of our starters are coming back, so that's going to be a big thing going into next season. But I have to say, I'm confident about Shrewsbury. I mean, going in, no one has said anything bad about him, and I think he reinforced that. His speech yesterday was amazing. He answered the press really, really well. I just think if he hunkers down on recruiting and really gets some good people on the team, then we'll have a good next few seasons. Lot to unpack there with Micah Shrewsbury, and we'll see how things plan out as his first season at the helm of the Irish men's basketball program plays out over the summer. Kelly, JJ, they'll be back in a little bit, but right now let's send it back to the desk with Liz Perna. Thanks, Ryan. Last Saturday, Notre Dame men's lacrosse had its biggest home game in years as the number one ranked Irish took on number three ranked Virginia. Let's go to the field. First quarter, Chris Cavanaugh, the sophomore from New York, takes two steps and slings it in to put points on the board. He rightly celebrates, and the Irish lead 1-0. The Cavaliers came rolling back. Here, Xander Dixon receives the underhand pass. No defenders to be found. Virginia leads 5-1. Xander Dixon's a player to watch in college this year, scoring his 27th goal of the season and averaging more than three per game. Let's go to the second half. Pat Cavanaugh, this, this team's leader, shoots from deep. Ball goes right, left of the keeper. This game is tied. Notre Dame football made an appearance at this game, and they're loving it. How does Virginia respond? Like the number three ranked team in the country should. Off the deflection, Xander Dixon again in, is in the right place at the right time. He puts it in. Virginia leads by one. From there on, it was all Cavaliers. It never trailed again, and Xander Dips Dixon kept on contributing. Here, wide open, he puts one last Cavs goal in the net. Virginia scores 15 on the day. The Irish get one more to get to 10. They lose this one and lose their title as the number one team in the country. On a brighter note, Irish fans across the country and across campus received great news on Sunday night. Notre Dame's fencing program won yet another national championship. For more, we send it to Helen Wynn. This past weekend, the Notre Dame fencing team went to Duke and won the program's 13th yeah. national championship. Our fencing program holds more NCAA championships 
than any other Notre Dame sports program, surpassing the football program's 11 titles. This is also the team's third national title in a row, and they are the only Notre Dame sports program to achieve this feat. Congratulations to the 12 fencers who competed, and shout out to Luke Linder and Esther Muari for bringing home two individual national championships. Yeah? Oh, thank you, Sweet, for dunking this weekend, Liz, and great to see them. Back, holding up that reputation. Great to see it, a fencing school after all. All right, last week we mentioned that university president, Father John Jenkins and Jack Swarbrick wrote a peculiar op-ed in the New York Times, arguing for institutional change in the NCAA. However, Jenkins and Swarbrick have faced opposition to their suggestions, with some arguing that their beliefs are outdated and don't apply to the hundreds of schools across the country which don't have the same academic standards as Notre Dame. Let's send it to JJ and Kelly to hear their thoughts. Guys? Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at the op-ed, I think there's, there's a couple of things you can make with it. I think the first and the biggest is that fundamentally they're not saying anything that is that out there. You know, everything that they said has been said before. Everything that they've said has been said before by the university. So I, I think a lot of the criticism, a lot of the commentary that came from it was a bit confusing because there was nothing in that statement that Notre Dame hasn't previously said. There was nothing in the statement that hasn't been said by people that aren't Notre Dame. That being said, I do think there, there is some merited commentary on it. You know, people. I think Andy Staples in the Athletic made a very good point, saying the reason this criticism, this uh, commentary from Notre Dame doesn't ring as true as it does is not that Notre Dame has done anything wrong in the NIL state, so much that it's done a lot of stuff right. Notre Dame has proven in the NIL era that a school of Notre Dame's caliber can host athletes on campus, that can have NIL deals, that can still be involved in the campus community. Notre Dame's athletes, as surveyed by the Athletic, pretty much by and large said Notre Dame does one of the a uniquely good job of having athletes incorporated in campus life. So the interesting kind of perspective here is Notre Dame is saying NIL is changing college athletics fundamentally, which I think a lot of people would agree with. But Notre Dame is also simultaneously a school that is an example of a school that allows students to get NIL opportunities, which they've done, but also still be involved in the campus itself. So Notre Dame isn't really facing the problem they say they're kind of criticizing. They're, they're preemptively trying to address a problem they don't have. So I think if you're Notre Dame, you know, once again, it kind of comes back to the idea that there's nothing in this op-ed that was not previously stated. There was nothing in this op-ed that was exactly pushing the boundaries on NIL commentary. But it is something that, you know, if you look at how recruits might perceive Notre Dame, you know, it creates a buzz that I'm not sure Notre Dame expected. I'm not sure maybe they, they thought the reception was going to be more positive. It's going to be interesting to see if this affects how recruits view the school, how they view the opportunities the school might be able to provide them, and whether that matches up with Notre Dame's actual contribution to the NIL space, NIL space which, widely speaking, have been positive. Definitely, definitely. I, I definitely agree. I wouldn't have expected the criticism that came. I think everything that Father John and Jack Swarbrick said, we expected. I mean, Notre Dame is an excellent academic, athletic, and religious institution. But my only concern was they were trying to push these ideals onto other schools. And I don't think, as you said, these values apply to all schools across the board. I mean, some schools are just very, very athletic focused and don't have that same academic rigor that we do. Um, in terms of recruitment, I think, I think it'll actually help our recruitment efforts. I think it'll attract athletes that align with our values. And I think we should be investing in athletes that align with our values because that'll make sure they stick. What, do you have any other thoughts on recruitment in terms of that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the takeaway is recruitment's a, a side effect, but I don't think it's the main issue. I think, I think the big thing for Notre Dame is how much of this will be perceived, because the NCAA obviously has a new head coming in, Charlie Baker, the former governor of Massachusetts, a very political move by the NCAA as they try to kind of navigate what is likely going to be a very political era of NCAA legislation, given that they've called upon Congress, and Notre Dame is calling upon political forces to kind of intervene here. The question becomes, you know, how much influence will Notre Dame have with Baker, with the NCAA, and will they be able to get the NCAA to move to more of a legislative model and how they do things? Will they be able to get outside regulation? Because it has been proven the NCAA cannot really legislate this new landscape of NIL. It's been proven they are outmatched in trying to get the schools to bend to their will, and in the courts, they've been outmatched. So Notre Dame and it seems the NCAA want to find some sort of higher power to influence how NIL is regulated and how it is done in the world of college sports. The question is just a matter of how much sway does Notre Dame have and whether they will get their way. But we'll go back to the desk now. We'll get back to this at a later topic. I'm sure there are many more takes from many more people in the studio. But back to Notre Dame sports and back to Liz and Ryan. Kelly and JJ, it'll be interesting to see for sure. 
Ryan, it wouldn't be right for us to have a show today without covering the national holiday which occurred yesterday. Absolutely. It's one of our favorite days of the year. And let's take it to the diamond to catch up on the highlights from the action on opening day. Starting in New York, where the Yankees and Captain Aaron Judge take on the team he was rumored to be playing for this year, the baseball Giants. If there's any question about whether the Judge was in chambers or not, that was answered today. Bottom of the first, first half bat of the season, off the sinker, Judge belts one deep to center field. Yankees lead one to nothing. They win it five to one. Your final. Let's go to the Midwest now. Adam Wainwright making his last opening day start before the game. A little bit of a surprise singing the national anthem. And we won't play the audio. He's more of a baseball player than a singer, though, if you do listen to it. To the field, bottom of the third, one on, two out. Tyler O'Neill drives to deep right. He gets it to be a 4-3 game. Now going to the ninth, a close game. This is George Springer at the plate. He bloops one over the shortstop's head. Will it drop? Yes, it will. He drives in the tying run there. Later in the inning, still one out. Vlad Guerrero gets a good piece of the ball, and it is far enough out. He gets it back fly for the go-ahead run. That was enough to do it. Blue Jays take this one by a final score of 10-9. to Keeping it in the Midwest, let's stay in Missouri. Twins and Royals, two teams who might be battling for the Central come the offseason. Twins acquired Joey Gallo, sorry about that. Twins acquired Joey Gallo this offseason. He faces a shift here, but Melendez in right field, unable to make the play. He records an error there. Now we go to the sixth. Buxton is healthy, playing DH, and here he shows off his power, bringing the ball to the gap. Kyle Isbell can't get it, and Buxton gets three bases off this, here sliding into third safely. Now with Trevor Larnick at the plate, he singles to center field, bringing Buxton in, and Twins one, Royals zero. And that would be all for Frankie on the day. He finished with four strikeouts. Rocco Baldelli calls for Donovan Solano to enter the game for Gallo, and here he singles to left. Twins decide to send the slow Trevor Larnick around. A bad throw by the Royals, he scores. It's Twins leading two to nothing. No change in the score here on the ninth. Twins bring in their all-star John Duran, who delivers and gets the save. Twins take this one two to nothing, your final score. All right, back on campus. In recent weeks, some athletes have made major announcements about their status for next year. JJ Starling, the highest rated recruit to ever play at Notre Dame, has announced he will be transferring to Syracuse. Starling originally is from New York. In his first year at Notre Dame, Starling played an undefined role and underwhelmed fans, averaging 11.2 points per game off 42.1% shooting from the field. On the ice, Ryan Bischel and Trevor Janicki both announced that they will be returning for another year. Bischel was the Big Ten goaltender of the year, posting a 9.931 percentage. Janicki finished the season second on the team with 22 points from eight goals and 14 assists. Bischel and Janicki were the only players to play in all 37 games last season. We now break from the sports action to talk about a big upcoming event on campus, the Idea Week concert at Purcell Pavilion features Walker Hayes. Our friends at MD Sunrise have more. Country star Walker Hayes, known for his viral sensation Fancy Like, is coming to perform at the Purcell Pavilion on April 15th as part of his Duck Buck tour. My name's Lillian Jockman, I'm a Notre Dame freshman, and I interviewed Hayes as he prepared to hit the road with his wife, six kids, and three dogs in tow. So, Walker, during your tour, you live in a tour bus with your entire family, including your wife, Lainey, and your six kids, who range in ages from 7 to 17. So, just tell me, what is that like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is it's constant chaos, Lillian. I mean, it's never, there is literally never a dull moment. You know, I know that's a cliche um, that people say, but in our life, it is never dull. Yeah, I can I can imagine. So just tell me a little bit more about how the logistics work. Uh, how does school work for the kids? How does sleeping work when there's, you know, eight of you all on a bus? Just tell me a little bit more about that. Um, we, my, my wife homeschools our kids. We all have our own bunk, um, you know, where we sleep. The dogs join a different person each night. We actually have three dogs now. My gosh, three dogs. That is crazy. So you have this huge family. What do you do to keep your family entertained while you're on the road? Every Wednesday night um, when it picks, uh, picks us up, there's a laundry basket full of books, you know, that my kids use for school. 
Um, underneath the bus, we pack scooters, uh, skateboards, basketballs, footballs, bats, uh, wiffle ball bat. You know anything, you know we can do in the parking garage beneath the arena or on the field at the festival or you know wherever we're playing. And then just tell me, why has having your kids um, along with you on this journey um, made it so special for you? Um, you know, I can walk on stage from a game of Jenga. I mean, we can be backstage going at it, playing a game of Jenga, playing a game of Phase 10, uh, watching a football game, and I can literally go step into a huddle pray with my team, and then walk on stage. And then as soon as the show ends, we can go and pick up, you know, where we left off. It's a special atmosphere for me. I'm just so grateful, you know, that my kids they make it the, the grace so graciously. Um, they make it easy for me to be a present father because I don't ever have to say bye to them. And that was Walker Hayes, singer of Fancy Like on traveling with his family of eight on tour. Walker will be here at Notre Dame at the Purcell Pavilion on April 15th, so buy your tickets now. For ND Sunrise, I'm Lillian Jocelyn. Guys, what are your thoughts as we enter one of the best weekends of the year? Yeah, I mean, I think starting on the men's side, I think UConn is the team that I got my eye on. You know, it brings me no pleasure to say this as a UConn hater, but they have been absolutely dominant this year, at least in March, when the games have mattered most in this tournament, they have been absolutely electric. You see Gonzaga, typically the best team they've faced all tournament, and they, there was some early struggles, you know, see here, it was a four-point game heading into the end of the half, but they got this three here, and they just ran away with it in the second. This team has been dominant in March. You see here, they've pulled away from Gonzaga. They play with a lot of energy. The way they get up the court, they get down the court, they play hard nose on defense, but they get up and they play with tempo on offense. It's a fun team to watch, and it's a team that I think looking forward these final two games. You know, there have been some questions asked about Coach Dan Hurley. He's never really had that good game experience before. This is going to be two games where he gets to prove it. You can't ask for a bigger stage than this, but this UConn team is fun. They run up the score on offense. They play with a lot of electricity. I think against Miami, we'll get to see two high pitch, high octane offenses. I think Hurley's going to have a real shot to show that he is indeed a big game coach. Kelly, thoughts? As much as I love UConn, I have to go with the team that's going to win it all, San Diego State, obviously from the best city in the entire world. You see here that they dom dominated Alabama. Their coach, Brian Dutcher, had a central role in recruiting the Fab Five at Michigan in 1991. And it's his first time, it's San Diego State's first time in the Final Four, and it's his first time. He's actually the second oldest coach to make the men's Final Four debut in the past 25 years. I'm just excited to see how this plays out. I think San Diego State actually has a chance to dominate this game. They're first in the Final Four and in the championship. Um, like I said, JJ, as much as I love UConn, I have to go with San Diego State on this one. I mean, it'll be great to see. I'm excited. It's going to be a great weekend for basketball. Yeah, and the one team I think on the women's side you need to watch is the best team, South Carolina. <laughs> I mean, I, see, I saw people saying, like, oh, Indiana lost, my bracket's busted. Why did you not pick the team that has won 30-plus straight games by 20 points or more? This team is the best in college basketball. They've got the best coach. They've got the best player. They've got the most dominant player, I should say, because we'll get to Caitlin Clark in a bit. But Aaliyah Boston, you see here, down low for South Carolina, is basically unstoppable. She's a player that no one has found an answer for in two years now, and I don't think teams are going to start with two games remaining in the season. You know, this is a team that has players all over the court that can hurt you. You know, we talk about Boston being the dominant force down low, but she draws teams in, and I'll give it out to Zia Cook, who the name is applicable because she will cook you. She's been doing it since high school. Anyone who's seen her hook group mixtape knows she can get to the rack and she can bring the ball she can bring the ball up the court with intensity she's a player that i think can really get south carolina going on offense and really this team has so much balance the de defensive stability you want to see in title winner is there they've got the offense in boston and cook to really combine and put teams on the ropes just such a impressive combination of coaching by john staley who is for my money the best coach in college basketball right now as well as the combination of cook and boston and everyone else they've got on that floor it's just such an unbeatable you know mixture of components for that championship caliber team they won the championship last year i don't see any reason why they won't do it again this year i mean yeah we'll have to see iowa got a visit from sue bird this week what are our thoughts well to first respond to jj i do agree i think south carolina is going to win it all but you had to have notre dame in your as your champion you had to you just had to if it weren't for those injuries then I think we could have gotten there but despite that um, Iowa is a great team and Caitlin Clark I mean just a dominant dominant player her 
her stats against Louisville this past game was actually crazy. She had a triple-double, 40 points, um, which is a record for men's and women's basketball. Um, I think Iowa should have initially been seeded number one, so this could have been a title game. I think Caitlin Clark versus Aaliyah Boston in this upcoming game is going to be just a, a great thing to watch, a great thing for women's basketball. Um, I mean, just these highlights here. She's, she's dominating this team all by herself. It's kind of crazy to watch, but I'm excited to see her and what she can do against South Carolina. I think if anyone can put up a good game, I think it's going to be her. Yeah, she is absolutely on fire lately. It's going to be great to watch. Men's and women's basketball, we have a great weekend ahead of us. All right, for all of us in the studio, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe to our YouTube page. Comment your thoughts. We wish you a great Final Four weekend, and thank you for watching.